welcome to our uh, webinar, Plants You Can Brag About. Uh, this will be uh, posted to the Xerces Society's YouTube channel uh, on the Bee City USA playlist if you want to share it. Um, give us about a week so we can get it up, and then uh, we'll also share it in the next e-newsletter. So uh, if you're subscribed to the Bee City USA e-newsletter, um, you'll get that in March, around mid-March. Um, and if you're not subscribed, you can do so at the bottom of any of the web, the web pages for bcityusa.org. At the very bottom, there's a spot to um, join our e-newsletter. All right, so if you're interested, there is closed captioning available. It does pretty well with our complicated <laughs> pesticide names and whatnot. So give it a shot if you'd like it. Uh, but I'll go ahead and start some introductions of our staff. We're lucky to have uh, quite a few staff joining us today. Um, I'm uh, the national coordinator of uh, Bee City USA and Bee Campus USA for the Xerces Society. I'm uh, Laura Rost and uh, our kind of uh, host of <laughs> our, our behind the scenes organizer and um, uh, tech person today is Carly Hirschman who just became uh, the Community Engagement Assistant. So she is going to be helping Bee City part-time and then our other uh, outreach and education program, the Ambassadors Program part-time. We're kind of splitting her hours between the two. So we're really excited to have Carly join us. Um, and then we also have Matthew Shepard, uh, the supervisor of our programs, uh, Director of Outreach and, of, and Education for the Xerces Society. And um, is a May on here yet? I'm not sure if she joined yet. Have you seen her, Sharon? No. Okay. Yeah. I'll hold off in introducing her then in case she doesn't make it. <laughs> uh, but I'll go ahead and introduce you to Sharon Salvaggio. Uh, she is uh, with the Xerces Society. She is our pesticide program specialist, and she will be conducting our presentation. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let her take over. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, if you have uh, questions or comments, please share them in the chat and we'll be kind of observing throughout the presentation and then we'll have time for a good amount of time for discussion afterwards. Yeah. All right. Go okay. ahead, Sharon. Thanks, Laura. I'm going to share my screen. And um, Are you seeing that? Okay, yes, we're seeing the proper view now. Okay. All right. Um, well, before I begin, just one note about Amay. She's my supervisor, the P pesticide program director, and she will be here at the question discussion um, portion of the presentation to help answer questions. So uh, you can meet her then. And um, I just want to say, you know, it's great to be here. I am. Uh, excited to be here today to talk to you because bee cities and campuses are such a powerful force. It's a huge network nationwide and you're doing amazing things, as you can see from this great photo here. So um, this is UC Davis um, students planting pollinator plants on campus. And so I'm going to take to talk to you about something that you might not think about a lot, but bragging rights, <laughs> specifically how you as um, BC USA affiliates can work with your local nurseries to assure pollinator safe plants for your cities and campuses and be leaders in this for the country. So let's dive in. But let me first say, as Laura mentioned, that I'm with the Xerces Society, like our other staff. Our organization, as you may know, was founded in 1971 by Robert Michael Pyle, and it was named after this lovely little blue butterfly, the Xerces Blue, which was actually driven extinct by human development, sadly. So we've got this beautiful photo of it, but it inspired Robert Michael Pyle and others who have come since then to work on protecting the life that sustains us. And I know that you engaged with that as well. None of us could survive without the ecological services of invertebrates. Specifically, invertebrates are food for countless other animals. They provide pollination services for all of our plants. Well, not all, but a whole bunch of our plants, the majority of them. They also provide decomposition and recycling, something we may not often think about, but without that, plants couldn't get the nutrients that they need to grow. 
they purify water, and they provide natural pest control for free, something that's really important to somebody like me who's a pesticide program specialist. So this slide shows just eight of the millions of species, or however many there are, <laughs> Matthew could probably say. Um, they're wildly diverse, sometimes incredibly beautiful, and they all play one or more of these roles. So today, um, this is sort of an outline of what I'm gonna talk about. First, the opportunity that we have here. Second, a short discussion on whether plants are safe now, safe from pesticides. Third, solutions. And fourth, approaching your nurseries. And then we'll have discussion. This isn't gonna be a very long presentation, so we'll have lots of time for discussion. So we do have a huge opportunity through the Bee City and Bee Campus program. You may be the most powerful force out there nationwide for pollinator conservation. Your call to increase pollinator habitat, engage your community in pollinator conservation, and reduce pesticide use hits three really big things. First, ecological restoration. Second, social change, which is so important. And third, reducing our toxic impact on the planet. And restoring pollinator habitat in particular has taken off like wildfire and nobody is doing it more enthusiastically than bee cities and bee campuses, as you can see in these fantastic photos from affiliates that are part of the program. And what is needed for this work? Well, a robust supply of pollinator safe native plants. Again, uh, these are photos um, from affiliates and as well as our Habitat Kit program. So purchasing plants to create habitat within parks and public spaces is part of the process for most bee cities and campuses. This means that we have an opportunity. Affiliates, especially those affiliates that are in close proximity to other bee campuses and cities can leverage their joint purchasing power when you procure plants by using a contract grow procedure that can assure pollinator safe plants. Let's talk about why that might be a good idea for pollinators. Most of us are aware that pesticides sometimes kill pollinators. More often they have what we call sublethal effects, damaging their reproductive potential, affecting their memory, behavior, and so on. Really, none of these impacts is good because they can, uh, uh, they can really impact fitness, essentially the ability for populations to survive and thrive. And especially when we're looking at species that are already diminished, like the monarch butterfly shown here on the left in the caterpillar stage, we have concerns. Pollinators can uptake pesticides by a number of means. One is getting sprayed directly when they're sort of like in the way when a pesticide spray happens. Second is when they contact residues after a spray. They might not be present, but they may fly in or crawl in and they can touch those contaminated surfaces with their, their cuticle, with their antennae, with their feet, and so on. They also can consume pesticide residues that are on or inside leaves or in nectar or pollen. And they can even get exposed to pesticides by consuming contaminated prey. We have a study about that with the hoverfly. That's a really interesting example. So when we buy plants and we protect them from pesticides in our own gardens or park spaces, we can protect pollinators visiting those plants from being sprayed directly or from contacting the residues topically that might be on our own plants but we really can't protect from that third exposure mechanism, which is consuming residues that are in or on the plants, unless we've taken steps to assure that we start with pollinator safe plants. Which brings us to the question, can we count on important pollinator plants to be safe now? We have been talking about this for quite a while. And so, we, we know that there's some studies out there, and what do these studies show that regard pesticide residues on nursery plants? Well, studies show um, that we can't assume that they are safe. Unfortunately, most commercial group nurseries and greenhouses do use pesticides on the plants that they produce, including insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. 
And from studies on nursery plants, we see that typically nursery plants contain lots of residues, different pesticides, usually multiple insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. And sometimes those, what we call residue loads, are at levels high enough to even kill bees. And pesticides that get inside the plant, what we call systemic, these can result in residues that are available in leaf or nectar later, sometimes a long time later. Woody plants, shrubs and trees, they can express systemic pesticides for months to years after an application. For example, in 2022, Xerces teamed up with researchers at the University of Nevada to look specifically at leaf pesticide residues on and in Asclepias or milkweed plants. As you know, the obligatory host plant for monarchs. And what we found was that the leaves contained an average of 12 pesticides each with a range of two to 28 pesticides per plant. And across the study as a whole, which drew leaf samples from 235 different plants, we found 61 different pesticides overall. The majority of these were insecticides and fungicides, about evenly split, but we did find some herbicides. So the number of chemicals raised questions about whether those chemicals have the ability to interact inside plants um, or interact inside monarch caterpillars once they've been consumed, causing higher toxic effects than if alone. These kinds of interactions, including synergy or multiplied effects, have been seen in other studies. The results definitely looked concerning. What did this mean for monarchs? Depressingly though, the literature on how pesticides affect monarchs is still very, very slim. Toxic effects to monarchs from pesticide exposure at the caterpillar stage are really mostly unknown. Only nine of the 61 chemicals that we found have even been tested on monarch caterpillars. So even with toxicity data for only nine of those 61 pesticides, we still found that nearly 40% of the plants contain pesticides at levels considered toxic. These toxic plants came from about, about half of the sampled locations nationwide. The toxic effects that we were able to identify were mostly due to two fungicides, which was sort of a surprise. Um, and these occurred at concentrations associated with shorter adult wing lengths, smaller adult monarchs. So size, specifically wing length, has been correlated with migratory ability in monarchs. And as you know, this is a migratory species that has an incredible sort of like monarch, migratory footprint. So finding fungicides and milkweeds at levels that affect the wing size, it certainly raised concern. And this wasn't the first time that fungicides have been associated with negative effects on pollinators, but most of the information that we had previously was linked with bees. Previous studies have found associations between fungicides and reduced larval survival, lower pupil weight, and reduced adult longevity. They basically don't live as long. Um, fungicides can also inhibit the breakdown of certain insecticides. So we have concerns. We often are thinking about insecticides first, but um, fungicides are also something that we need to think about. So this study added to the existing literature about pesticide residues on nursery plants at the retail point of sale. There are some other studies that looked at this issue that I've summarized on this slide. This slide has a fair amount of information. I just wanted you to get a sense that our concern about the problem isn't theoretical. It comes from data in several published studies. For example, the first study, which came from the UK, looked at 29 samples of bee-friendly plants. 92% of the plants had pesticide residues with an average number of pesticides per plant of 3.3. Now that's a lot lower than our study, but they only screened for 24 pesticides. We screened for 92 in the milkweed study. In that UK study, they found neonics in more than 70% of the plants. Um, and both neonics and an insecticide called chlorpyrifos were found at levels known to harm bees at growth, reproduction, and immunity effects. A second study, um, flowers, leaves, and stems were taken from bee-friendly plants bought from big box retailers across the US. There were 71 samples evaluated. 
about half of those had residues. They only screened for neonics, so they didn't really calculate like the number of pesticides per plant. But in the results, they found that 20% of the plants that had positive results contained not just one neonic, but two or more neonics. And when you look, when they looked at those combined concentrations, um, the range went all the way up to 748 parts per billion in flowers. You know, you might be like, what does that mean? Well, this was well above a level that could kill a bee. And there was almost triple this amount in stems and leaves. So that study raised some concern. Then the next one, um, this was also a study that we entered into with the University of Nevada. It was part of a larger study that looked at milkweed pesticide residues across the Central Valley of California. But 11 of the samples came directly from retail nurseries. And 100% um, of those plants had residues with the average number of pesticides per plant being really high, 23. There were 30 different pesticides detected. And when those were compared to levels lethal for honeybees, 55% of the plants were affected. And the two chemicals that were responsible for that was a diamide called cyanotranilaprol and a neonic called thiamethoxin. You may think, okay, you were looking at milkweed leaves, why are you comparing it to honeybee residue, which is a really good point. But in this study, um, the levels in those leaves were also compared to levels lethal for lep Lepidoptera, which is really a fairer comparison because caterpillars crawl on leaves and, and consume those leaves. And 55% of the plants were affected, cyanotranilaprol and chlorantranilaprol being the two big chemicals of concern there, and methoxyphenazide affecting 18% of the plants. The difference in this study versus the one that I talked to you about before and that's summarized in the bottom row is that the, um, we looked at Lepidoptera in general, not just monarch studies. There's a lot more studies when you look at a broader suite of different Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths. And so we were finding um, a couple, some insecticides there to be at pretty high levels when you looked at those other studies. So the takeaway is that, you know, generally what we're finding at the retail point of sale is that plants have multiple pesticides, even in plants known to be valuable to pollinators. And these toxic effects are often associated with neonics, but it extends beyond neonics. We've got some concern about other classes of chemicals, the diamides, fungicides, and so on. So we need to be thinking about all of that. Now I'm not trying to paint growers, nursery growers as insensitive to biodiversity concerns. I've talked to many, many growers and in looking at studies and talking to them, I've learned a little bit about why it's hard for nurseries to kick pesticides. There are these, uh, you know, on this slide, I summarized some of the root causes or factors that result in um, the use of pesticides and in pesticides being widespread in nursery plants. First, um, nursery growers are often growing in greenhouses, especially when the plants are young. And these conditions are often conducive to pest outbreaks. We have to remember too that the peak sale time for nursery growers is Mother's Day. So often they're starting you know, these young plants in the middle of winter, trying to keep them warm and growing in January and February. And this isn't necessarily you know, setting the plants up to be pest free. Um, it's not you know, the best time of year, they need to be kept in warm and humid conditions so that the growth can happen. And that often results in a lot of diseases. Second factor is that um, nursery growers have a big concern that sales could be affected if there's any sign of plant damage like leaf chewing or presence of insects or you know, blemishes on the leaves that might indicate disease. This is a cosmetic standard. These things don't necessarily affect the plant's survival or health, but us as consu consumers, you know, we like to buy things that look really perfect. And so, um, growers are, you know, sort of rationally responding to that desire for cosmetic, you know, um, appearance um, that, that, that buyers put out there. Um, so this is something for all of us to think about. 
A third really important thing to know is that um, those who have looked at nursery budgets and compared, you know, basically tried to put together what does it look like kind of on average, looking at a bunch of different nurseries, pesticides are cheap relative to labor. Pesticides only comprise 2% of the average um, production nursery's budget, but labor is 26% of their budget. So um, that means that growers are going to be sensitive to anything that increases their labor costs. So this is something to know. Um, both states and the federal government both have, um, well, all have plant health regulations. And these have been created with good intention. It's to try to keep harmful pests and diseases from crossing state lines and moving across the country. You know, we're all familiar, I think, with certain invasives that have, you know, spread like wildfire across the United States. And so these plant health regulations are in place to try to avoid that kind of thing. Obviously, they're not 100% effective, but within the nursery trade, this means that pesticides are often applied when a nursery is planning to ship because they can, their plants can be inspected by a a state regulator and they can actually, they have the power to stop a nursery from, from shipping their plants if they see something that concerns them. Another factor is that for certain pesticides, nurseries can use much higher rates per plant than what's allowed for food crop. So um, it makes sense that we're seeing some pretty high residue levels as a result of that. Then there's the lack of awareness from buyers about sort of, uh, you know, the way in which, you know, the, the nursery business works and how to even talk to the nursery. So this is just something that um, we'll talk about a little bit today. Um, and then a last factor, maybe not the last factor, but nurseries don't have to comply with labeling rules. Um, and we only have reporting rules in California. Um, but those reporting rules, I mean, you have to know how to get into the database and so on and so forth. So there's just, you know, there's a lot of barriers for consumers to really know um, if harmful pesticides have been used on their plants. So let's talk about what are the solutions? We at Zoses are committed to sourcing plants that are safer for pollinators, and we know that it takes some work. So I wanna share with you now how we do that. This goes without saying practically, but first focus on finding plants native to your local area and hopefully from a local nursery who specializes in native plants. While you probably are going to be able to find the kinds of plants that you want there. You can't necessarily assume a native plant grower is completely avoiding harmful pesticides. We've certainly seen that some do use harmful pesticides, but we've also found many native plant growers who are very careful about their pest management practices and pesticide choices. So this is a really good place to make sure that you start. Second, Take the time to learn about the nursery's growing practices, specifically the pest management and pesticide practices. We have these two publications at our website. These are here to help you. And each of them provides some information and guidance on, on how to do this. Um, buying bee safe plants is geared toward a more casual consumer buying at retail. So there's a good chance that Bee City and campus affiliates are buying wholesale. This gives you a great opportunity to have an in-depth conversation with a lead grower at the nursery that's actually producing the plants. So that is what we recommend doing is take the time to call those nurseries up and to ask for the person who is the lead grower or lead IPM manager and ask them if you could have an hour or so of their time to ask them about the, the pest management practices and their pesticide practices. Now this takes some work um, and some practice uh, and a little bit of knowledge, but it's really a step worth taking. Um, the interview focuses on monitoring and pest prevention practices, not just asking about which pesticides they use. Ultimately, you'll get a sense of how pollinator safe your growers pest management methods are. And this will provide you peace of mind and help you to identify and favor those who are implementing the most solid and pollinator protective pest management programs. A further step you can take is to set up a contract grow. This term might be new to you, so let's talk about what it is. This is 
a definition that I'm borrowing from a, a company called Specialty Trees. Contract growing is a service offered by a number of production nurseries that allows landscapers, developers, and designers to reserve plant material sometime before it's required, sometimes years in advance. Usually there's a deposit to secure the deal and the pricing is locked in over the course of the job. And most importantly, the material is grown and nurtured to required specifications and supplied when it is required. So this is a way to get assurance up front that you can get the kinds of plants that you want grown the way you want. And this is something that we also practice with many of our nurseries um, as we source our plants ourselves. At Xerxes, we thought about pesticides that might pose the most risk in terms of their toxicity to pollinators and in terms of their persistence and how long pesticides might last in plants. Our goal is to get plants that are what we call reliably safe, or in other words, finished plants that are free of pesticide residues that could result in harm for pollinators when the plants are delivered. It's not an absolute standard. It doesn't mean that no pesticide residues will ever be present. And it doesn't mean that no pesticides can ever be used on the plants, but it does allow us to be reasonably certain that the most concerning pesticides will be absent from our contract grown plants when we pick them up or present at low levels only. So specifically our procurement policy specifies that when we engage in a contract grow, we want the nursery to avoid certain pesticides. In designing this, we considered protections for bees and their brood. So looking at larval um, sensitivity, butterflies and their caterpillars. And the specific provisions are that some pesticides are disallowed on the plants, the soil media, or through chemigation throughout the growing period. Some pesticides are disallowed two weeks before delivery. How it works more specifically is that um, our specs disallow use of 26 systemic insecticides throughout the production cycle and disallows use of 99 other pesticides, which are certain insecticides and fungicides, mostly the contact type for two weeks prior to delivery. This eliminates higher risk pesticides of concern and increases safety of the plants at purchase. Taken together with the results of our interview with the nursery, which happens first, this helps us assess the nursery prevention and monitoring practices Together, these steps help us support ecologically sound production. So we don't jump into a contract grow with a nursery before we've actually had an interview with them and we've been able to assess their overall practices. So we encourage you as B-City affiliates to think about adopting this approach in your own purchasing. We know this takes some thought planting, planning and a little bit of interpersonal skill as well. So let's talk through some of the steps that you might consider. So first, identify those likely production nurseries. Who are the native plant nurseries in your area? What do they produce? What is your previous experience with them? Who owns that nursery? What are their attitudes toward pollinator conservation and pest management? You can also think about um, who the staff is there. Staff can make a major um, difference and, and you find out more when you actually get to know the nursery. Another really important step is to educate yourself on common nursery challenges. Like as I talked about in my, my earlier slide, nurseries have told us First of all, they hate it if someone comes in and they're demanding a hostel. Um, they have a lot of challenges. They are businesses. Um, and secondly, if people don't really understand their challenges, it's very frustrating to them to, you know, be confronted with someone who is asking or demanding something that might be really difficult for them to deliver. So remember, this is another person <laughs> on the other side and you know they're, they're doing the best that they can. And the more you know about you know, how the nursery business works and how, what growing challenges they actually face, the, the better you are to really be a, a good customer and, and to advocate for what you want as well. 
Third, interview the lead grower or the integrated pest management lead. This, these are the people who actually are in charge of growing the plants. You know, a big nursery is going to have a lot of staff. You know, sometimes it's really helpful to talk to the owner as well, but especially you want to talk to the lead grower IPM person. They'll be able to really give you a lot of information specifics about their general pest management practices, general and specific pest management practices. So do this first. If you feel that you're pretty comfortable with what you've heard, then you can ask them if they might be interested in a contract grow. You know, I mean, this may depend on their side. If you've got enough plants that you're buying, you probably are not going to set up a contract grow if you're only going to buy 100 plants or something like that. But if you have a big enough order, you can then decide, does this seem like a good nursery? And then you can share the contract grow specifications by email. An important thing is to allow time for the nursery to review the specifications against their current practices. The, there's chemical names in there, not necessarily, the, no trade names because trade names change all the time. So they're gonna have to go through what it says and look at their own inventory and their own you know, practices and talk to their people probably. So it's gonna take a little time for them to look at it. If you don't hear from them, just follow through, you know, like you're still interested, what are they thinking? And then consider variances. This is not a hard and fast rule. We are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're starting this and, um, you know, embarking upon sort of a new method, um, asking for some new things, but it doesn't have to be a hard and fast rule. We, uh, on, speaking for Xerxes, we have decided to be flexible about this and to allow variances. Um, that is because if we make it too impossible, people can't do it. But we've also, you know, we have no streets that are eager to do this. So, you know, put it out there, see what they can do. And maybe they can produce, you know, a set of the plants they provide according to the specifications. Maybe some others can't be produced that way, but any progress is good progress. Finally, sign a contract once all the details have been talked through. So you may find that some nurseries are eager to go this route and don't have any conflict with their existing practices, while others might be more hesitant. Some ways that you might be able to help make it worth their while include collaborating with other nearby affiliates so that you can have a larger order. If you're working with other affiliates that are looking at a very similar suite of native plants, you know this should be something that could be pretty easy to work out logistically. And you can quantify your reach, like you may know that your city or campus buys a certain number of plants every year and another campus buys, you know, typically. So, you know, let these nurseries know that, you know, once this gets going, you'll be buying a regular order of plants on average, you know, maybe thousands of plants per year. And so together your budgets create leverage. Third, recognize the nursery um, for their efforts and sustainability. I think that this is a really important thing. As a nonprofit, we have to be careful about this aspect because of IRS rules about, um, about uh, I mean, I don't fully understand them myself, I'll say, but we just, as a nonprofit, we have to be careful about you know, highlighting any particular pri you know, private business um, exclusively or anything like that. But you can, um, you may have more flexibility being a campus or a city and recognizing the nursery for their efforts and sustainability might go a long ways. You can also perhaps consider, you know, depending upon the way your affiliate works and um, preferred vendor status for that nursery. So it's easier in the future to set up contracts with them, to buy plants from them, et cetera. And finally, you can provide resources and information about why this is important. Um, this, you know, you, may have more information than they do about pollinators, about host plants, about native plants, about lots of things, toxicology, and they may be very interested in this. So, um, you know, it can be a dialogue, go back and forth. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. And I just wanna invite you, if you think you're interested in pursuing this route, I invite you to reach out to me afterwards so we can talk in more detail about our process. I wanna say thank you so much to all of our wonderful Xerxes Society supporters. Um, this is our list of 
uh, funders, but we also have so many members, just thousands and thousands of members who help support our work. We couldn't do any of it without you. And you can join the movement um, as well. And if you are wanting to make a bigger difference for invertebrates, you can become one of our supporters by heading to our website at xerces.org slash donate. So thank you. My email is on this slide, um, sharon.salvaggio at xerces.org. And my name is on the website. And uh, so that's how you can reach me and we can jump into questions. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was wonderful. I really love this topic and I feel like this is, I love your approach with this and how to collaborate to move forward. I think that's a really neat approach and I feel like there, we have a lot of tools available to our B cities and B campuses to make this sort of work happen. So um, we have a number of questions in the chat. Um, feel free to raise your hand with the little icon if you want to speak your question. Uh, you can do so at the bottom of your screen. I think it's under, gosh, I don't even know what it's under. Well, anyway, yeah, the, let us know. The three dots where it says more, it should say raise hand under there. Thank you, Carly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have Ame Ko joining us now um, as well, who's the director of our pesticide program. So we have an additional expert to help out. Um, let's see. Uh, Let's go ahead and have Jermaine speak and I'll um, queue up some of these chat questions to go next after Jermaine. Go ahead. If Jermaine, if you are, it looks like you're unmuted, but I'm not hearing you. So um, feel free to speak up if you're messing around with your settings and can connect your mic. Okay, we'll just go ahead and do some of the chat questions. Um, Brenda asks regarding the uh, milkweed leaf study, when you found the 61 pesticides in 235 plants, were those from different nurseries and were any collected from wild uh, sources and checked for pesticides? Question now, do you want me to jump in on that one? Sure, go ahead, Ame. So. I'm not seeing that question. I'm seeing the, please repeat the question. It was about the retail question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah, not that... seeing in the chat. I've seen uh, Steve and Mary questions. It, it was pretty early on. So I don't know if you were here yet. I wasn't here yet. Okay, please repeat the question. Thank you. Uh, when you found the 61 pesticides on 235 plants, were those from different nurseries? Second, uh, were any collected from the wild and checked? So we actually had two different sampling tests. The first one we did look throughout the Central Valley of California and we did collect a lot of wild plants. The second one that was discussed in by Sharon, those were, we looked, um, we went to, six, we were in 16 different states and it, I think it was 35 different nurseries where we gathered those plants from. So they were all bought at retail establishments. And I, Sharon probably was clear, clear on this. No one plant had 61 pesticides. Overall, all of them combined, we had 61, but there were well over 20. How many in total for, for some of those plants? So there was a, mostly there were mixtures. Right. The average was 12 and the range was between two and 28 per plant. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Next up. Uh, regarding the pesticide residue point of sale um, uh, slide, does bee friendly mean that the box stores labeled the plants as bee friendly? That's a good question. I, those two studies that I mentioned, um, they indicated in the, the study itself that they collected bee friendly plants. Um, and these are plants that I think the study authors selected because they knew that these plants have value to pollinators. Um, I don't remember seeing that they were actually labeled so. And I think just one thing I wanna say about that is that there's no regulatory um, standard for what bee friendly means, um, which means that 
that nurseries can label things with with them um, with this bee friendly pollinator friendly tag and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's pollinator safe we try to use the, the term safe to differentiate from that but again without any kind of national standard there really is no no guidance no 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 regulation on that thank you okay uh jane asks Weren't neonics banned in Europe? Go ahead, Amay. I know you know more about this. Oh, that's generous. Um, <laughs> some of the most toxic neonicotinoids were, uh, for the most part, banned in Europe. It started with treated seed and then expanded to a number of other neonicotinoid uses. There are some variances and exceptions, but yes, they have been for the most part banned. Now the EU is using them and there are some member states that are using them and as I said, variances and select uses that are still occurring. A question about that, does that ban only cover field crops or is does it extend to nursery plants that might, that sometimes are grown in the field and sometimes are grown in greenhouses. So it's a little bit of a mix. You know, I, I do not know. And so, but it's something to look into. I remember at one point it was definitely um, very much outdoor uses that were focused on, but it had there. Yeah. I'm not certain. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and just a reminder, everyone, well, we can go over the hour. So if we don't get to your questions and you see the hour approaching, don't worry. Well, we can stay on for a bit to continue to answer questions. Uh, next up. Uh, this may have, from Heather, she asks, um, this may have already been stated, but uh, is this PowerPoint available for us uh, after the presentation? Yeah, we usually are happy to share that. Yeah. Okay. And this will, the whole presentation uh, will be on our YouTube channel on the B City USA playlist. Um, but um, if Sharon, Sharon can provide the link to me and then I'll share it in the next e-newsletter as well. Um, and um, you can also reach out to Sharon directly, her emails in the comments if you have more questions. Um, thank you. And yeah, there was quite a bit of interest in a few of those slides. So I know um, some people will be studying those. <laughs> okay, uh, Amanda asks um, from the findings from the field slide, uh, how big were the sample sizes? you know which one that is? <laughs> yeah, the, they varied. Um, I showed four studies on there and the number of samples varied from 11 to 235. So it just varied study by study. Um, yeah. And then our study, I mentioned that we had, you know, 16 states, approximately 35 different um, nurseries. And we, for each grouping of plants. So sometimes a nursery would buy multiple groupings, depend they had multiple species of milkweed, but we would do groups of five. So we, just because we didn't want too much discrepancy between one plant and another. What if one was at the corner and it had more spray? So we would grab five at each of each species of plant at each store. And that's how, that's how our sample size worked. Yeah. Those individual plants weren't combined though. So they were each tested separately. So, but you can look at a nursery's data and kind of see like, oh yeah, like none of them had this or one of them had this, maybe that was from a drift event or something. So it, it did give you a sense of how consistently those plants had been treated. Uh, Matthew says in the comment, our, our Matthew Shepard, <laughs> Uh, so he provide a provides a link to the current status of the neonic ban in the EU, and he quotes it saying, it prohibits the use of these three neonicotinoids and bee attractive crops, including maize, oilseed, rape, and sunflower, with the exception of uses in greenhouses of treatment of some crops after flowering and of winter cereals. Thank you. Matthew. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you, Matthew. Thank you. All right, Steve asks, reporting requirements would seem to be key for consumers to choose. The very popular greenhouse, which grows out the vast majority of the plants they sell, say they do not use pesticides, but I've never seen any insect damage in any of the dozen houses open to the public. Can I believe them? Um, well, I, 
I think indirectly, I, I, um, I want to just go back to the definition of pesticides. Some people interpret the term pesticides as meaning only insecticides, and possibly they are avoiding all insecticides. I don't know. You really have to talk to them more deeply. Um, but it is important when you talk to nurseries to, to clarify that you're not only talking about insecticides, that you want to also talk to them about their fungicide use. And if you choose their herbicide use, but we like to talk specifically to them about their um, insecticides and their fungicide use. Um, I think when you get into a deeper interview, you can go beyond a, you know, maybe a yes, no question. Do you use pesticides? Do you not? In all likelihood, that, that question is not going to give you much useful information, especially if you're talking to somebody who's at the cash register. And so we really recommend for the city affiliates in particular, if you're buying a lot of plants for public spaces, that you go to the wholesale nursery or the, the production nursery that is actually producing the plants, make an appointment um, ahead of time to talk to the lead grower um, and have a much more in-depth conversation. You'll get a lot more useful information that way. I mean, just quickly, because Steve did talk about these are the nurseries that grow out the plants and that there wasn't insect damage. But I do think, um, depending on who you talk to, a lot of people, like Sharon pointed out, people don't always understand all the practices are happening. So you definitely want to talk to the person in charge of pest management to figure out what kind of chemicals they're using. And definitely we getting information about their use and asking for use data can be challenging because it's hard for them to provide all that, but it, it definitely is a really good a way to verify practices. So, yeah. Uh, I you, think, yeah, go. Go ahead. Nope, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> all right, uh, Jim George, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, I'm with the Audubon uh, Society in North Carolina, and North Carolina has legislated uh, now that uh, native plants be used on roadsides and in state parks, but we're very concerned that they will be buying uh, plants that are loaded with systemic insecticides and such. So we're trying to figure out how to work with them in the process of them, they'll probably send this out on bids or something and, you know, how we can sort of intervene or somehow uh, encourage them to uh, put in the bidding process that this would be, uh, in especially the worst in, uh, systemic insecticide free plants. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's great to hear that you're already on it and really working with um, like the Department of Transportation or I'm not quite sure which agency, agencies that you're working with directly, but to, you know, put this in front of them, they probably, you know, um, are going to be really grateful to have this information from you. Uh, hard to say. I'm sure the growers will not be enthused about it. So that could be a problem. Had, I think Sharon indicated, we've had a real, we've definitely had a mix of responses and quite a few people are actually really excited to, to chat with us. And, you know, most people who are in the business of growing native plants are doing it because they love native plants and they love the biodiversity and love what they bring to the environment. So a lot of growers are excited to then take another step in their knowledge about how to grow these plants in a in the best way possible. So I come to it with that mindset. If I find that the grower's in a different place, I have to step back and be, you know, diplomatic and thoughtful. But most people really, there is a lot of interest. And when we create kind of simple ways for them to take some steps towards being more sustainable and more ecologically sound, they are willing to take those steps. And I think that's exactly what has been, we've worked really hard to create at Xerces with the contract grow and the questions and the evaluation of their work. So hopefully it could be in that bidding process, questions about their practices could somehow be incorporated. 
Thank you, Jim, Anna Mae, and Sharon. All right, next up we have Mary. Is it true that for some systemic pesticides, treated plants can produce seeds that have trace elements of that pesticide? That's a great question. And I, we unfortunately don't have a lot of research on that, particularly for um, nursery plant seeds. Um, we can look at, you know, crop plants and look at seeds, um, but with very different kinds of, you know, pest application scenario, pesticide application scenarios and amounts that might be used, it can be a little bit difficult to, um, you know, extrapolate from that. Um, I think that there's less concern that we have in general, but, you know, we caution about that because there's still, you know, like very little research, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, just, I totally agree with you, Sharon. The only, I, you know, when we're talking about a plant that have had a foliar application and it grows and then it produces seed um, compared to, you know, a, a plant that gets a soil drench and then there's a caterpillar eating that plant, like the risk to the exposure level that we're thinking about and the amount of a pesticide that's being used. And yeah, the risk we're trying to avoid is a lot bigger with those immediate concerns. Um, when you can track back and get organic, you know, seeds that have been grown through an organic practice, that's wonderful because that means cradle to grave, we've got the right, pra the practices that, you know, are going to be more sustainable or that are, you know, even beyond, I don't know, organic is too simple of a term, but if people are using sustainable practices, yeah, I don't know if that helped, but as far as with the breadth of risk that's out there, with the kind of levels we were finding on plants, that last step of the seed that grew from another plant, sometimes we, that it doesn't feel like the place with the biggest impact to push back on. And that doesn't mean we don't want it to be done better, but we're, we're just a small group trying to do what we can in the biggest impact. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up we have Brenda. So how would one go about approaching growers if we are looking to purchase much smaller scale, homeowner scale, if there are is no bee city near me. Yeah, um, I will start and may, you may wanna join in on this, but the buying bee safe plants and offering bee safe plants guides are a great place to start. They start from a you know assumption that you're actually going to a retail nursery. And so it gives you questions that are framed for retail nurseries. Um, if you were able to locate a native plant nursery near you that also sells retail, um, you can go in and really get to know them and have a much more in-depth interview. But if you're buying from a retailer who is selling plants from a variety of different growers, go ahead and you know utilize those um, buying basic that buying basic plants guide. That's a really good way to to get started. Um, then you can scale up. And <laughs> May, I'm going to turn this over to you for possible thoughts about scaling up as a homeowner? Well, I mean, I think you answered the question. I don't know what you mean by scaling up as a homeowner, honestly. Oh. <laughs> I think it means, although become a bee city, help your neighborhood buy more plants. No, I think it is, it's, it's feeling comfortable to walk in and chat with the retailer. Sharon kind of alluded to this, but if it's a small nursery and they are growing those growing out those plants they're going to know more about the production practices than a large retailer that probably bought plants from other folks um, so it does help if you can get to a nursery where they actually are growing the plants themselves you'll learn more about their practices and their chemical use than you would at a large retailer but if you do go to a large retailer checking with their plant buyer and seeing if their plant buyer is has these concerns and is asking these questions. Sometimes as a consumer, the goal that we have to set for ourselves is to be informing our retailers of what we want. And we might not this year get what we want, but if retailers know that you want plants that are not just pollinator attractive, but also pollinator safe, they might take the extra step to be asking the questions of their suppliers to make sure that those plants are on the shelves for them. Yeah. 
Yeah, we have seen, you know, change in the nursery industry that, you know, neonics have decreased. They haven't gone away, but they have decreased. There's studies, again, that kind of look at that. Um, so consumer demand does make a difference, especially if it's widespread, if there's a lot of people asking. And if you're an educated consumer, you know, if you kind of know what you're looking for, how to ask the questions, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, these are all the things we're encouraging people to, to do and be. Yeah, yeah, positive feedback and creating a demand are so key. And um, you know, Sharon's been mentioning that our, one of our coworkers, Eric, has been talking about supply chain, that you pull a chain for demand. You, you can't push a chain. So you, you really, you have to create that demand to actually get the, these sort of actions to happen in a capitalist system. <laughs> All right, next up we have Savannah. Hello and thank you. My name is Savannah and I am a weed grower at Georgia State University's Native Plant Botanical Garden. Our nursery holds a spring and fall sale of va vast majority, 85% native or 85 plus percent native plants uh, for our region. I would love to have our nursery be, uh, be campus, Xerces Society grow certified or at least work towards the consideration. Uh, we are currently small, uh, one acre, um, around $100,000 a year where sales gross, uh, keeps two to three part-time staff. Would anyone interested and able to assist, please reach out to me at sdenning at gsu.edu. That's S-D-E-H-N-I-N-G at gsu.edu. Thank you so much for all of this excellent presentation. Anna, I wrote down your email. I'll be reaching out. <laughs> Thank you. This sounds like a great, um, this sounds like really a wonderful job and, and a really neat opportunity. Thanks. All right. We are at the top of the hour, but we're going to keep answering questions. But if you need to jump off, uh, you can hear the rest of this at a later date um, on the recording. Uh, but feel free to stick around um, and we'll keep answering questions. Uh, you can raise your hand or add them to the chat. Thank you. I hope if you're heading out, you have a great rest of your day. We really appreciate you and for being a part of B City and B Campus and uh, just for your interest in the subject. It really means a lot to us. All right, next up we have Susan. Our city stopped using glyphosates but is considering using them at a very low level, 2% in a compound to spray for cheatgrass. How damaging would that be? So challenging question to ask. Um, at Xerces, we are not opposed to all herbicide use, especially something like cheatgrass control when it's you know damaging biodiversity, depending on the acreage you're looking at, depending on the diversity of plants that are mixed in with that cheatgrass. Um, the impact can can differ. We actually also don't single out glyphosate as the only herbicide of concern. There's a number of herbicides that can be used with differing concerns associated with them. So we try not to have get rid of glyphosate, pop up something else in in um, as in, in exchange. Uh, do you know? I'm not going to be able to fully answer, but do you know the acreage that is going to be treated, and do you know the area? Uh, like if it's a, if it's still a diversified area, but there, it's intermixed with cheatgrass, or if it's really just cheatgrass. Um, this is the open space property, so there are about two thousand acres of open space. Um, a lot of it is smooth brome with cheatgrass, sort of on the margins where the trails are. So I don't think they would be spraying the entire system. It would be really trying to manage how the cheatgrass is invading along the trail edges. I think what I would, in these sort of instances where I usually focus is how can we, if they're going to be using glyphosate on this, um, if there aren't alternative practices I think they can use, um, and that I don't know if that's been explored. It has, yeah. Okay, then how do they make that use as targeted as possible and focused as possible and ensure that they don't have to come back every year? Like how do they also limit cheatgrass from moving back in? Are there other sources around this open space that are allowing cheatgrass to flourish? And so then we've got seed moving in. Um, 
I'm not, a, there are people at our office who know a lot more about cheatgrass and its concerns, how long the seeds live, et cetera. If burning is good or bad. I, that's not, I don't have that depth. But I think the big thing is be as focused as you can, be as strategic as you can to make the application be effective, and then take all the steps you can to not allow cheatgrass to come back. Does that mean reseeding? Does that mean talking to your neighbor so they're also controlling cheatgrass so it's not just moving in? But that's how I would approach that sort of a situation. Sharon, anything else? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's really the most important point is, you know, is there going to be some kind of planting of native grasses probably would be the most appropriate thing so that the space is taken up because sometimes what we see when herbicides are used if the planting isn't part of the plan or sort of a secondary afterthought you know whatever's in the seed bank is going to come 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 in and those might be other weeds it might be cheatgrass it could be even more damaging weeds so that secondary part is really important um one one last other quick thought timing of herbicide application, there are two critical pieces to be thinking about. One, timing that's most effective. Sometimes people wait until after something's gone to seed late in the season, it's harder to kill. And then you have a seed bank, right? Because not all herbicides kill seeds. Some do, some don't. And two, what kind of invertebrates do you have that are active when these when you're spraying? So trying to find that window when management will be most effective and least damaging to the Butterfly, butterflies that might be in the area, that the bees that might be foraging in the area, et cetera. So it's it's not always easy to find that window, but yeah. Great, thank you. Not to be a broken record, um, but for spot treatments, um, I also just, I'm always uh, promoting steam leaders. <laughs> they can be a great investment for a city. Uh, there's small and large scale models. Some are like a pressure washer style nozzle and others are more of like a cone sort of thing that goes over the weed and if you guys if you're apl uh, applying for grants or funding for a future year it sometimes can be a good investment for um, a municipality or campus Absolutely. i'm sorry say again what you call that a steam weeder steam. yeah mm -hmm. i won't say any brand names but they're pretty okay. easy to find online <laughs> okay i've i've watched different practices and there's some really effective steam weeders out there yeah. And they can kill the seeds too. Yep. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of the things we're working on is trying to figure out how we can get more funding towards, you know, alternative weed management, both in urban areas and in ag sites. And then if ever you're restoring sites, we also have a really great uh, kind of overview fact sheet report on organic site prep matters. This is different, but basically, you know, how do you prep a site to become a pollinator garden without using any chemicals? And so looks like Laura's gonna pull that up, but our organic site prep report. Yes. Yeah. I will post, we've got to Ame, uh, do you want the organic site preparation for wildflower establishment or organic site preparation methods, a comparative overview? I know the first one, but I think you should put them both up because okay. I need, now I need to read them. <laughs> <laughs> and if you all haven't done a deep dive on our website, um, that we have a shocking number of publications at Xerces.org. <laughs> um, if there's something you're looking for, feel free to reach out to us. We might be able to direct you to something. We have guides for roadside management, parks management, golf courses, mosquito management, a whole bunch, whole range of topics. <laughs> Okay, next up, um, Elizabeth asks, uh, she says, sorry if I missed this, are there examples slash boilerplates of contracts and one sheets that already that have already been developed so that smaller organizations wanting to pursue policies with local growers can use without having to reinvent the wheel? Yes, if you wanna reach out to me afterwards, I'd be happy to show you and talk to you in more detail about what we've developed. Okay. And someone put my email. I think someone put my email in the chat. So I think it's in there. Yes. Okay. We're almost towards the end of the questions. Uh, I have one from Steve. Uh, we don't buy from big box stores. Is it practical or very expensive for an interested homeowner to do test to do tests for levels of neonics or fungicides themselves? 
It's can be, I don't usually it, samples are done in batches and a single plant and each one is going to be about like a little over a hundred dollars when we do a batch. So it's, mm -hmm. is possible. And then you have to interpret what you find on that plant for what impact it might have, which also has layers of complexity. Are you worried? And oftentimes if you were to try to be getting, gathering pollen and nectar, it would be very hard and you probably might not, you might even have enough from a single plant if it was leaf tissue. I don't think it's the best way to move forward, I guess. I think it, I think that it, there's a lot of layers of problem with that. Um, although if you, as a community are interested and you have a group of folks coming together and doing some sampling, that might um, be, could add some value. I don't know, someone might, have a, might disagree. Sharon or others with thoughts? And I don't want to not have you do it. I mean, I understand the curiosity. I've had it myself when I was given a beautiful bush that was bought at a big box store and it was a pollinator attractive plant and it was a Mother's Day present and I had to keep it and I was quite concerned. But I, I actually, maybe I'll share the steps I took. I, I was concerned about it. So I removed the soil because the soil could be contaminated. And I removed blooms the first two years on that plant. And I covered it in case with a soft netting in case anyone else would want to visit it because I wasn't sure. So that I was overly cautious, but that's how I handled not knowing. Other thoughts? Thank, thank you for that uh, suggestion. That actually is um, great to have the personal <laughs> input. Um, uh, yeah, I, a hundred dollars is probably more than you know. I'm going to want to uh, invest myself, and and we do have options for organic uh, growers around here, who I trust. It's just they don't always have the range of plants that uh, usually my wife is looking for for her more intensive flower gardens. Um, but thank you. I um, you know it is a struggle as a small homeowner who's just trying to make things look really nice um, to to feel like um, we're not affecting the bees because our native bee populations at times are quite high and other times it seems like we just don't see them much at all. You know, and a lot of, depending on, uh, our native bees have really different behaviors and life cycles and there are definitely some bee species that you're only gonna see out for a few weeks out of the year. They're not going to be out all summer long like honeybees are. So um, whether that be bumblebees or other solitary bees, you don't always see all of those bees all the time. Many of them are only have a short flying season. Um, last thing, I don't know if Sharon mentioned it, maybe it's premature. We're currently, we would really love to create a system so that anyone can be assured that their plants that are pollinator attractive are also pollinator safe. And so we are kind of in an exploratory mode of can we create what we have for be, be better certified farms? Can we do something similar to that for nurseries, which would ensure that you've got pollinator attractive plants and you've got plants that are going to be reasonably safe from different harmful pesticides. So we're hoping to have that so that you can have the diversity of plants you want in your garden because diversity is important for those bees. Uh, yeah, and I'll put a link to our Be Better Certified program. It's it's similar to like an organic certification, but it's focused around bees and pollinators and whatnot. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that certification, right now it's mostly food focused, I believe. So, uh, but you can check it out in the chat. Um, Next up, we have, um, oh, we had a question. What was it? Um, steam, steam leaders, could they also kill soil bacteria? Um, I believe yes. Um, it, it, they, pen they can penetrate the soil a few inches, depending on how, how targeted, what type of, uh, do you have like the, kind of funnel sort of cover top that creates a seal around the ground versus the um, more pressure washer style nozzle. But yes, it would be killing soil bacteria as well. Um, I don't, I couldn't tell you the percentage though. I'm, it, it may not be, it may really depend on what you have. Uh, 
All right, uh, Amanda asks, not necessarily on topic, but do you have any recommendations on working with state DOTs? We've had some barriers to getting highway and DOT main maintained roadways planted with natives. We have a ton of resources on our website. Um, in fact, we have a number of materials that could help you understand how to get native plant get getting native plants along the roadsides and then best maintenance to to ensure that the pollinators can thrive there. But Laura, are you grabbing them offline right now? Oops. Yes. Yeah. And then if you do that, then the next one, I'll read the next Actually, question. I may, do you mind? I I've just been lurking in the background here, but on this one in particular, I just wanted to mention that um, if you're also looking for other resources, um, we have worked with the Federal Highway Administration to put together material, some of which are on our site, but also the Federal Highway Administration has um, a, a website that includes a lot of information about pollinator habitat on roadsides. And I only mention that because depending on who you're working with, um, it was Amanda, wasn't it, who asked the, the question. If you're working with your county or an agency, they may be more willing to accept information if it comes from the Federal Highways Administration as opposed to, um, you know, like conservationists or an environmental nonprofit. Um, but it is basically the same information because we we produced it for the Federal Highways and the contract. It's very true that the messenger is extremely important. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Laurel says, hello, I'm sorry uh, to join so late. I was in a meeting. I'll look up the recording. You may have already covered this, but just in case, I'd like to remind folks that native grasses provide pollen for bees, apis and native, and nectar for some butterflies, mestra species. I don't know if I said that right. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, grasses are really important. We were looking at different host plants um, and sampling them for pesticides as well. And there are many butterfly host plants that are grasses. I don't know if you, when you hopped on, we had been talking about cheap grass and management it earlier, not a native grass. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, okay. and the that produce pollen are native grasses. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laurel. Okay, we're getting almost to the very end of the questions. Jermaine asks, I would like to think that roadside plants would get polluted, or I would think that roadside plants would get polluted by car emissions, so they are not good to plant there. Any comments? Yeah, um, I, we're probably not the the most appropriate people from Xerxes to answer these kind of questions because we have other staff who work um, so much more with with roadsides and, and the habitat and so on. I'm thinking um, mainly of Jennifer Hopwood on our pollinator team and Angela Laws from our endangered species team. Um, there, there are always, good, I mean, I think in gen almost anywhere you plant these days in urban areas you're going to be dealing with things that are not ideal for pollinators um one reason we've been working on um on roadsides and you know habitat on roadsides is because there are places where it's the only habitat um and you know so some of the roadsides um, in in some states that have lost almost all of their prairies, for example, the roadsides are the only places that really still retain any semblance of um, native prairie. And so there are roadsides which can be important for the, the plant communities, um, either rare habitats or, in, I mean, I, I know places around here where it's some of the best populations of rare flowers still remain on, on roadsides. Um, and some roadsides are really wide. You know, the, the highway easement can go for, for a long distance away from the actual road. But yeah, it may not be the perfect ideal habitat, but it, it does help to, to fill a gap. Some 
Um, there are some pollution concerns. There are also concerns about maybe pollinators being squished by vehicles going past. So, yeah, not not ideal for sure, but in many areas better than nothing. Yeah, in our imperfect world, we try to create the highest quality habitat that we can and prioritize the sites that are going to be that high 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 quality and create the corridors. And Matthew's correct. Sometimes it's not always, yeah, it's that balance, finding the best places we can where we can. There actually was a study, I think Jennifer has referenced it a number of times, where the concern for your insects being squished by cars is pretty minimal compared to the abundance and richness that you can create in these areas. But there are definitely strips that are too thin and 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 not uh, and not appropriate. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, that um, the the study that Emma just uh, mentioned there, and and there, there, now there are more studies, and so you know, depending on which study you want to pick, you can come up with almost any answer you like. Um, but in general, the the research indicates that where you have a road site that is diverse plants, the butterflies, the pollinators stay in that area. And where you have road sites that lack plants, then then the pollinators are moving more and trying to, you know, in basically spending more time looking for for the flowers they need, and that's when they end up crossing the road. Um, that's a great point. I don't know if it, a lot of our native bee species, these solitary bees, only move a couple of hundred yards. They don't need a big or want a big space. If they've got what they need close by, they're staying close by. And when people are thinking honeybees and traveling for miles from their hive, it's very different for a lot of these smaller solitary bees. So yeah, give them what they want and they'll stay there contented. <laughs> All right, I think uh, we're pretty much, we've wrapped things up. So um, we are, um, we can go ahead and I think call it. <laughs> Um, again, this will be posted on YouTube and available uh, links in our next e-newsletter. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you joining us and for your interest in this topic uh, and uh, really appreciate your, your engagement. <laughs> I want to... I want to thank all the people with all the knowledge they have, because like there's an interest, you know, Laura was talking about a study in Michigan showing bees and butterflies getting blown off flowers. There is so much knowledge right here. We need to have more peer-to-peer -peer conversations, knowledge about pollen and nectar in, in grasses. So I just want to, yeah, thank everybody for bringing that knowledge to this group. Yes, we really appreciate your expertise. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for your lovely presentation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I look forward to talking with hopefully many of you afterwards. <laughs>